This meeting is being recorded. Awesome. Hello, everyone. Today is September 12th, 2022. This is a meeting of the SIG Network Policy API subgroup to SIG Network. This is a CNCF certified meeting, so please be nice to each other. And yeah, let's run through what we have got going on today. So first thing on the agenda was just a shout out that the, for anyone watching this, shout out that the new website is up and running on GitHub Pages. Um, this is a call for everyone to please take a look at it. Um, file issues, like let's add to it. Let's make this really cool. Um, we can add basically anything we want because we own it. And then next steps will be just to get it deployed to a Kubernetes URL via Netify. So that's in progress. Um, otherwise, the agenda was pretty short for today. But Rahul, I think, does have some stuff he wants to talk about around FQDN coming off of the awesome presentation he gave us last time around some of their data collection. So um, do you want to take it away, Rahul? Yeah, sure. Uh, so the first thing was something that I mentioned doing last time around and I, um, it took me a bit, but I finally got it. So the goal was we, Pierre and I presented some data that we'd gotten from our, um, from our customers. And I was thinking that it'd be good for other folks to run the survey as well. Um, other CNI providers, especially those who have FQDN network policies, um, just with the goal of understanding what customers are up to and hopefully we can build something um, you know, useful for them. Uh, so I added a link to just a sample survey of like what we might wanna circulate around. Um, I, my goal right now was get some feedback from folks on is there, are there any questions that are missing? Are there any things that we should add, tweak? And then it would be good to um, maybe have folks reach out to customers that they know are using this feature, but also maybe just put out a blast on SIG network um, and say, hey, just an open call in case someone wants to comment on this. We'll just try to gather a little bit more data so we're more informed. Um, the main goal of this survey, just to, I guess, shape what my thinking was, is to figure out whether folks um, need the sort of wildcard matcher um, because that's that's a really big um, feature that that has um, architecture ramifications. Like it changes what sort of implementations can work and what can, can't. So the goal is to understand: Are people using wildcard matchers, or are they okay with just a list of FQDNs? Um, and also, I want to know how many people are also running service meshes or you know proper L7 uh, capabilities versus how many people are using very specifically, these still L4 policies, essentially. Um, so that, that's the goal behind this survey. Um, please, yeah, like, like send out comments or stuff if you have thoughts on this. I actually, can I present the screen? I might just- Yeah, I made you co-host, go for it. I would have been, but I upgraded my Fedora and can't share. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me, let me try this. Yeah, we got it. You're on mute, Rahul. Uh, how about how about now? Yeah, there you go. Okay, I hate how it does that. That's super <laughs> annoying. <laughs> yeah. Um. Anyways, the yeah. So here are some questions that we were playing around with. This one is pretty generic, just to get a feel for what people are actually doing with their FQDN policies. It's unlikely to affect the implementation, but just something interesting to note. Um, if you think there'd be value in more specific uh, drop down, um, you know, narrow specifications here, we can do that. But I was just curious what customers are doing. Um, this one is trying to get to the heart of the matter is, do you use FQDN policies to match exact domain names, i.e., you know, some deeply nested domain subname? Do you use FQDN policies to do a pattern match? Do you write something like star.mydomain.io? Uh, and that that will really help by identify where we want to go with this. This one's a little bit of a, a long-winded question, and there's a lot to wrap your head around. It drops you into the meat of it. 
Um, but basically the idea is, is this, is this something that requires an active proxy um, in the middle of DNS resolution or is this something we can, uh, you know, you do asynchronously? Uh, like all the, from what I read from Dan's comments, all of the good implementations try to intercept DNS traffic and, you know, update their allow lists with whatever they're feeding back to the pods. And so this is a, we're just trying to get customers to say, yes, that seems reasonable to me. Like I'm okay requiring a DNS request before I send out traffic or if they want to write network policies using FQDNs, but their traffic is just raw IPs without any DNS queries backing it. Um, this one's kind of a weird question. So are there any like question um, clarifications here? So you oh, present so, it. So, so, Sorry, yeah, so, so, so this sort of things works perfectly if you have two end user applications, <clears throat> but if yeah. you would have something that is would do some VPN like application, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> then you would not do DNS question. You would obviously just take whatever comes on the wire and it's the application that you VPN for where that would have to do the DNS in that case. So now that is probably not the most common <laughs> Kubernetes application that's for, for sure. But uh, there, there are many types of applications uh, where you don't have the sort of actual session initiator in, in your own application. So in that it case, would, it be, would you be filtering ingress traffic? So I mean, what's, what's obvious when I talk about this, I, I do a lot of routers and load balances at layer four level, right? And then uh -huh. normally you, you act as a middleman, so to speak, uh, that you, some, someone <clears throat> might, I mean, if you're load balanced, you have a VIP, right? Mm -hmm. Someone does a lookup of that, you do transformation, then typically you would not have an FQDL. But uh, that's the only sort of cases I can see really where, where someone, you have cases where people just use addresses and those are sort of easy to go and say that's bad practice. But then you have things where, where something will be uh, uh, a, a proxy of some type at layer four. On the other hand, you would probably never use an FQDM in such a uh, firewall rule. I mean, it would be very hard. Right. Yeah, that's, that's what I was hoping. I was hoping that if the application is using FQDNs, then it makes sense for a security admin to write FQDNs as part of the policy. But if your application is some sort of, you know, router or middleman, it probably makes more sense to be writing those rules in terms of, you know, the IP blocks that the router is managing or something like that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Sure. But this question specifically is more like, <clears throat> is it, it, it's more saying like, do you want us to drop the, tr like, would you want an implementation to drop the DNS query specifically or to be still mapping to an IP? Is that like what the question is? Is like, would you be all right with us dropping a DNS query or do you actually want us to be firmly on layer three dropping an IP? Um. Yeah, actually, maybe I misrepresented this question. Uh, it is, a, it's a good one. It's just a little confusing. <laughs> it is a little bit confusing. I think I might have confused myself. So, so I mean, the, the, the real problem comes when you have a combination of this and like I had before, right, with the uh, star in front. I mean, you have all the addresses in a the domain, then you really want something to do the lookup so you can tag on on that lookup. <clears throat> And again, then that you have control over the DNS from that pod. Uh, actually, that you, you have control over the resolver, right? So no one goes and use a encrypted DNS logic. What you're saying is that you want to push so that you can listen into the, the uh, resolve answer. And by that, uh, enabling uh, this address in the firewall. I mean, I think the wildcard matching is more three, like this, from what I, like when I read it again, it's, it's literally like, do you want us to be dropping traffic on a layer seven sort of my, mantra, or do you want this to be a true, or I say layer seven, uh, upper layer mantra, or do you want this to be a true IP 
firewall. Like, like it's but, almost. But no, th th this is a separate question from that. This, this is no. not about blocking DNS as a way to block IP. No, no, no. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Okay. I see. We probably should ask that question. Um, I, I think that's a pretty valid question to ask. Um, I just assumed that the customer who we're targeting with this isn't okay with just pure DNS filtering. I mean, the, the, why use FQDS is, of course, that many people have no clue about the IP addresses. They know what they're trying to reach, mm -hmm. but so they, they not even, might not even know what an IP address is, especially if you start having IPv6 addresses, then many people just get brain colds. It seems very weird for, for someone to be saying, my application needs to hard code IPs, but I want to write policies specifying FQDNs rather than IPs. That that just seems like that that not a use case. Like if the uh, application no. is hard coding IPs, then you should write your network policy to hard code the same IPs, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I agree with you. Yeah. Like I said, um, the the only time I have that you, and if you do a like we said before the example I brought up, if if you do a policy. No, it's a sort of proxy. I mean, obviously, you're going to have to base it on addresses. This is sort of. Mm -hmm. It would be very. It would be very weird uh, VPN solution otherwise. Yeah, maybe, I, for, I, maybe I, for my kids where they where they're allowed to go, but. <laughs> <laughs> I I included this because I I remember someone having an opinion on this in insig network where they uh, I, I don't remember the details now because we brought this team, up to team, team have well. had a lot of uh, i mean i think tim had a lot of opinions i had a lot of opinions and i think dan also had a lot of opinions yeah on, on the whole uh... but, but my I opinion mean... was that we do want to be doing it this way <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping we'll we'll be able to just back it up with some more data of customers agreeing with us here, because I think we all think this is how it should be done. Just get verification from customers. I, I think the big problem with the, the DNS idea is, and, and um, Parik might have said this, is like if they're using encrypted, you know, like DNS over HTTPS or, or something rather than DNS that we can snoop. Yeah. Um, that becomes tricky because then I guess you need to be, you need the DNS provider to be complicit in your network policy enforcement. Yeah. But I'm, I'm hoping that that can be an implementation detail. Um, like, you know, if maybe some CNI down the line will provide a all-in-one solution and say, yeah, if you want to use encrypted DNS, go ahead and also deploy our special core DNS pods or whatever. And but, I guess we can also not have to think about the subset of applications sort of that, that set their own resolver. I mean, that runs much more than uh, just a normal stack, right? So there's more yeah. than a normal pod and run their own resolve libraries and so on and might go to a DNS server encrypted or non-encrypted that's outside the scope of the local. Uh... Are you listening in on traffic or are you doping the DNS resolver right now? The, the thing that I was looking at was essentially adding a, a, a hop in the middle. Um, so yeah, you yeah, put yeah. a proxy in the middle and then... Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. So the, the DNS resolve would point there. Yeah, so that's question five will hopefully get us some clarity on that. Um, I'm hoping customers aren't doing too much craziness here, but it's Kubernetes. You can't, <laughs> you can't rely on that. Um, yeah, and then just asking about the service mesh, do you use the service mesh capabilities to write you know, proper L7 rules. Um, are there any other, I think one thing would be um, ask if DNS filtering is sufficient. Uh, 
uh, yeah, I'll, I'll work on crafting this question because I feel like it's kind of subtle for anyone who's not a so not familiar with networking. So, so my my biggest sort of well, not biggest, but one fear I have, and this is sort of not with current Kubernetes, but at the same time on some other place where it's starting to discuss more multi-networking and so on, where you have many interfaces in a pod. And then it gets a lot harder to keep control on over where the resolver is and all of these things. And obviously everything that's network policies will be a lot more complicated, but sort of the more special solution that's needed, the, hard, the, sort of the, the more cases will be that that is not working because someone do it from a different VRF in the pod. And so I think the, I'm mm -hmm. not saying we shouldn't do this, but I mean, the, the, the sort of the definitions on when this is possible to use should be uh, well, well, dis well described. And when, if I should say sort of multi-networking becomes a actuality, then obviously sort of that, that needs to be really, really clear. And overall, I think network policies will be a very interesting area if we go multi-networking. <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting point. I hadn't thought of that. Yeah, like what if you resolve DNS with one um, network attachment and then try to send out traffic on the other one? That it's a mm. little funky, but not thoroughly unreasonable. Yeah, yeah it's like it's not nothing really that's there now, but I mean, it's it, it would yeah. happen down the road. Um, and then the rest of the survey is just as interesting more than anything else. It's trying to get an idea of who's writing these policies. Um, this might help inform whether we can just fold FQDN into maybe like a v, V1 alpha two of admin network policy or whether we really do need a namespaced version or, or anything like that. And then just some cluster info. Um, It'll help with understanding the scale that we're dealing with. I don't know that it'll affect the API too much, but I figure since we're asking customers, we might as well get some, you know, feedback. Um, but yeah, this is this is a survey that I'm thinking of blasting out, um, and I can make it into a Google form. I'd like to ask if you guys are comfortable sharing this with your customers as well. It'd be good to get some data on what people are up to. Yeah, I mean, I think, Dan, we could probably do something like this. I don't know how that would work in OpenShift, but I would imagine there's some way we can send out a survey. Is that something you've done before? Um, I feel like we must have done it, but I mean, just sending an email to SIG Network seems fine. Yeah, I think that's a good starting point. But like, if if we're trying to get some actual customer data, like I, I can definitely try to see what we would need to do for OpenShift. Like in OpenShift, the naming is just a little different. What, what, what instead of you set up a poll somewhere and then you send a list on SIG networks and so on and pointing people to it because uh, so that it can be sort of forwarded one more layer. That's what I'm getting at. I mean, yeah. We made this into like you know a, a Google form or whatever. Then people yeah. on Sig Network could just forward that URL to their yeah. customers. Exactly. Yeah, um, I can I can go ahead and make a Google form out of it. Um, I just wrote them up like this since I just want to run them by folks. See if there's any additions or clarifications you think we need. Obviously, um, if there was some way sort of to splash it at KubeCon, then we might also get people answering. Oh, that's an interesting point. Um, when is KubeCon again? Is that October? Yeah. Was it eight? Yeah. Um, yeah. It's October 24th. I mean, we yeah, might exactly. be, I could even mention this um, if we get it's like a, a streamlined form. I'm talking in the SIG network meet and greet, and I could like throw it in a slideshow there, probably. Yeah, that'd be pretty awesome. Um, so that might be helpful. And if not, I'm sure we can find somewhere else to put that <laughs> link so that it gets some love somewhere. Yeah. OK, I'll, I'll go ahead and make this a proper Google form so we can just link that out to folks who are interested in filling it out.
Yeah, um, no, thanks for doing this. This is awesome. I think it will help maybe limit some of the <laughs> implementation debate in Signet. I don't know. <laughs> might help. Might help. Um, yeah, and the other thing I wanted to talk about, and this is probably a longer topic, but um, well, let me figure out how this shit works. Uh, the other thing I wanted to talk through was just revisiting the doc that we had for FQDN policies. Um, I, I do need to refine the user story section, but one of the things that we were still debating and I wanted to get clarification on is whether CNIs that currently do FQDN can agree that this seems like a decent set of common behaviors. Um, that was another big um, stumbling block that I think Tim pointed out to me was if we can't get every CNI that has FQDN network policy today to agree on what this API should do, then it's pretty much dead in the water. And there's not much progress Kubernetes as a whole can make on this. So I, I'll i probably have to reach out to folks individually. Like I'll have to ask Yang what um, Entria is doing. Um, but this is, I think, the core set of behaviors that I've been able to call out. Um, and it would be good to get you all to just take a look through this and see if what we're describing is reasonable. Um, I don't think it's too crazy. Like we're saying, it's only egress policies. Um, it's this one might be a little bit tricky. It's specifically, you know, allow list with uh, a implicit deny, backing it just because of the way DNS works. You can't writing deny rules based on FQDNs is always tricky and weird. Um, here we call out that regex matching is allowed. Um, I said only prefix, no like pattern matching. I don't think this doesn't have to be a strong requirement. We can relax it. I just figured it's easier to be more restrictive and loosen it later. Um, yeah, this one is just sort of says it doesn't act specially. Uh, if you write an FQDN policy allowing traffic to go to Twitter.com, it doesn't magically let you talk to KubeDNS um, or you know whatever your in-cluster DNS provider is. This is a, it's it's good in that there's no magic behavior. It's bad in that writing an FQDN policy while not being able to talk to, to, talk to the DNS provider is pretty uh, silly. It, it, it's it's not super functional if you can't resolve a DNS. So maybe maybe we do want to flip this. Maybe we do want to say you can talk to your cluster DNS provider if there's an FQDN policy, just so the policy actually works. So yeah, so so I tried to remember. I see my comments on the sign and so on. I know what I reacted so strongly on with the star was that I mean I was not thinking of a solution that would sort of listen in on the uh on the lookups right when they happen uh -huh. from the application but rather something that would read the rules and then do its own mappings so i can't remember if it's clear clearly described in the beginning sort of the approach that's that's suggested with this that it actually is listening into uh, the lookups because then the star makes perfect sense because then you would know oh okay this matches to 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 this rule because you will read the text right and not just see the addresses. I don't know if that's expressed really high up. I mean, from the beginning, the call it the uh, model that is supposed to listen to the application is supposed to do, do the NAS lookup, and then the the system will listen, basically look at the DNS lookups, and from that sort of uh, be able to get the a yes or no, should this be allowed, uh, instead of sort of reading this, resolving it on its own, which it's not always possible, right? I mean, if you have a, a half a million entities under for a star, right. you don't want to have all that in your database. I think if that is described, I mean, then, then, that, then that can be discussed if, if it makes sense to have a uh, uh, listener or proxy, basically man in the middle or mm -hmm. not, uh, and sort of then 
when, we, when the, the rest is described, that is done. Because I think last time that sort of got uh, sort of intervened in the discussions and uh, we talked around each other a bit. Uh, so I think yeah. that, that should be sort of described, may, not maybe not exactly clear, but earlier, sort of what is the operational model? For me now that it's clear, it's, I don't react on the star anymore, but then I was like freaking out. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, I. That's a good point. I think that the thing I was concerned about, and maybe maybe we should do it anyhow, was I didn't want to prescribe a a single architecture for this. No, but you can say that the, that's the ex expected behavior, and that's why the star works. If someone figure out to do it some other way, great. Yeah. That, that's what I would do. That makes sense. Um, yeah, we can call out because I think we had a couple of thoughts. We were thinking you can maybe do a core DNS plugin and then core DNS yeah. tells your uh, CNI what to do, or you can have a Absolutely. proxy in the middle. So, yeah. yeah. So my reaction was that there's so many dom domains that don't let you do an LS on the domain to sort of get right. out what's underneath. Right. Uh, so, so. Okay, that's, yeah. that's a good point. Let me, let me just add a comment for myself. Okie dokie. Um, let's see. Uh, so actually one... just thinking yeah. now, an another good question to be asking people is, um, are you using an HTTP based protocol? And if so, is there some reason you couldn't just use an HTTP proxy rather than a, a or, 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 or you know, is, is there any reason why this has to be done at L3 rather than L7? Um, other than just, well, we don't want to have to deal with setting it up ourselves. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I guess you could say, if you go in and look at it, does Kubernetes have a sort of one layer seven network policy today or several in reality? We say we have network policies, but they're totally layer three slash layer four. Right. It, it... I just feel like a lot of people who want this feature, like even like most of the people using the version of this feature in OpenShift, I feel like they would be happier with with a, a, a HTTP proxy. But because they're thinking about the problem in terms of policy, they want it yeah. to look like network policy. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, I think. But and and yeah, and I don't know if there's any way we could automatically set it up as an HTTP proxy, but yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Let's let's add that as a question to the survey. Um, ask them why they want L three L four, or if they're okay with uh, having a proper yeah. HTTP proxy or or something like that. And yeah, I think when uh, Peter and I surveyed our customers, granted our sample size was like seven or eight customers. But we got about a 50-50 split between they are using a proxy and they aren't. Um, so I suspect there's a good number of people who don't want an HTTP proxy, but we should verify that. I mean, I can totally imagine there are people who don't want to deal with setting it up. Um, like they, they would like something more automatic than that. Right. But it's like if you're going to get something that's more automatic but not as good a feature and you know requires us to be intercepting your dns traffic and blah 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 then do you still want that or would you rather go with the http proxy in that case and what if kubernetes made it easy for you to set up an http proxy somehow i don't know how we would do that but <laughs> well at least it makes it clear what's what the expected behavior is right if you would yeah. know yeah like the the one concern i have heard from customers is that they aren't using http they're using some other rpc protocol 
And so, you know, their, their requirements might be a little bit different, but yeah, we should, we should clarify that. Um, all right, so I, I made a note of that in the survey. I'll, I'll flesh that out. Um, but yeah, other expected behaviors, uh, pods are required to make a DNS before the traffic is allowed to. Um, <laughs> I forgot to fill out this example, but I think we, we talked about this. I think we're all on the same page here. Um, yeah, IPs reported by cluster DNS service are the only IPs we need to allow list. Uh, this comes back to the same thing of if they have other DNS resolvers, we're not quite getting in that business just yet. Um, FQDN honors TTLs, uh, pretty self-explanatory. I think this was a little bit open-ended. You know, what happens if you've got a long running connection past the TTL of the DNS record um, and the connection's still active, it's just the TTL of DNS expired. I think it makes sense to look, keep the traffic going. I don't know if you guys have any thoughts. I mean, there's that little side thread going there. And what I said there, like in, in the case now where when you have a connection open and the policies change, what happens? You know, we're, we're generally happy to, to say existing connections are not necessarily affected by changes. So I think ne network policy applies to connection establishment. It does not apply to active connections. Right. I think this is yeah. different, though, in that if a TTL expires, it's not so much that someone made a policy change. It's just the natural behavior of DNS, if you will. Like if, if you just happen to get a record with a short TTL, but you want a long connection, I think that's a valid use case oh. that we should we should be opinionated about. Right. Like we should say, yeah, if the TTL expires, that's OK. You can still keep your connection around. as opposed to someone actually changed the policy definition, at which point, yeah, maybe we let CNIs do whatever they want. But. Yeah, so that's, that's one open, kind of open-ended thing. We can be as specific as we want on that. Uh, the other thing is, FQDN enforcement for cluster local services. Um, this one's something I've heard opinions on both sides about. Um, basically, the thing that it comes down to is if you try to resolve a cluster local service, you just get the VIP. Um, and so it behaves a little bit differently than any other FQDN because, you know, QProxy or whatever you have going is going to translate that VIP into a pod IP oftentimes before network policy gets enforced. And so your FQDN system needs to be smart enough to handle that, or, you know, we say it's actually not supported. You should be using label selectors and regular network policy for things inside of your cluster. Um, yeah, for, for now, I'm saying you should be using network policies, but if anyone has any contrasting opinions, I'm open to hearing them. I mean, it's, I, I think you're right there. Like, I mean, we're, we're talking about egress traffic to the outside world almost explicitly, right, with this proposal, right. so. Yeah. Awesome, yeah, and then the final one is just something calling out scale in IPv4, IPv6. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's that's the main things. I'm I'll follow up with Yang and a few other folks and just see if they have any thoughts on these um, these basic requirements. I'll, I'll flesh some of this stuff out further. Sweet, but yep. I think you but you you might like if you can't get a hold of people either. Like just looking at the documentation, you should be able to express uh, answer some of these, if not all of them. Yeah, yeah. So like, um, that, that might be a good resource. I, I don't know. If, if anything, 
Uh, Antria is the thing that I'm most concerned about because it does look like they have denied DNS policies. Mm -hmm. At least that's what it seemed like from the documentation. And I just want to talk to Yang and see what his um, experience with that has been because our, our stance right now is that that's a bad idea, that it won't work well. But yeah. Well, it's really hard to make work well, <laughs> I'd say, right? Yeah, it might work, but it also might create some holes. Whereas that the the white white list model is definitely a little bit safer for something where you're working directly. <laughs> so um, anyway, yeah, I just reach out to Yang in the channel. Maybe I know he's still been super busy, so he hasn't been around really. Yeah, I'll reach out to him. Um, that might actually pose a problem if we try to do this in um, in admin network policy. Yeah. That's, that's exactly what I was thinking. And it, it had been so long since we first started this, but we had definitely talked about that <laughs> um, when we <laughs> thought about it forever ago. Um, <clears throat> so let's think about it some more and, and see, because I don't think we're ever going to add, be adding an ex implicit deny into admin network policy, right? That would be against right. core behaviors, right? So it's definitely something to think, something to think about. Uh, um, the only other thing that's happened since is <clears throat> we did add um, the status field and network policy, but again, I, mean, <laughs> I think going down the road of augmenting network policy is the right thing. I think of anything like the network policy v2 or its own resource, right? So. Right. <clears throat> but we need to sell Signet before we can go down that route, right? So we don't go down <laughs> that route and come back. Um, no, and that's 100%. the hard part. Yeah, so we'll, we'll see how this goes. Cool, yeah. And if you get a Google Forms link, just post it here. But I think pushing that at KubeCon and seeing if we could get some info would be really great. So it's a great idea. I know it's a still a month or so away, but. I, I'll be there. I definitely can push it manually. <laughs> yeah, that would be awesome. I'll, I'll, I'll be sure to get the form out in like a week or so. Cool. Awesome. Well, thanks for keeping up the work on this. I know it's frustrating, like especially early on. And are, are you the only one working on this or are there other folks from Google helping out? No, it's, it's, it's pretty much a one-man show right now. Okay. Um, yeah. So that, that's why it's slow going. It's whenever I get a few cycles to... <sighs> Do, yeah. do a little progress. I, I push the needle a little bit. Totally. Been in the same boat. Well, reach out if we can help at all. Um, starting to hopefully have a little more time. There's some folks coming in from Red Hat who have been helping out with admin network policy. So have some extra cycles, finally. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Is there anything else folks want to talk about today? OK. On that note, we'll get some time back, 20 minutes. Uh, thanks for stopping by <coughs> a good conversation and uh, we'll keep on chugging. I hope everyone has a good rest of the week. Talk to you soon. Take thanks, care. Bye. Bye.